Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next episode of Community Therapy. We are joined today by Chantel and Stephanie. We are so excited to dive into our conversation about peer-to-peer communities. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Chantel to introduce herself. And then Stephanie, I'd love for you to introduce yourself as well. So, hi, I'm Chantel. I mean, it's so weird because I'm, I'm, I'm actually way fit and I'm like, I don't need to. Um, but yeah, I'm Chantel, founder of Beverly Planta. Um, we deliver sustainable dining, dining experiences, cooking classes, and, and gardening workshops. I'm also a independent consultant and strategist. Uh, I guess I specialize in community building, um, D, like DEI as well, and also just, you know, genuinely just really love youth empowerment. So I've been doing that through two. Um, um, being a board trustee of two community interest companies. Yes. Chantal, thank you so much. And Stephanie, over to you. Thank you so much, Morgan, Chantal, and all. My name is Stephanie. Uh, I have been a community builder for the past uh, decade-ish, give or take. Um, I have done quite a bit of external community building, but uh, more recently I have been um, building internal community for mm-hmm. quite a few um, SaaS technology companies uh, based here out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and pleasure to be here. Ah, we're so excited to have both of you here today and to be talking about peer to peer networks. So to dive right in and networks, communities, and kind of just peer to peer relationships out large. And as we're diving into these questions, we're so excited to finally be answering these questions that have largely been coming from our audience as well. So to kind of set the table and make sure that we're all on the same page, what is a peer-to-peer community? How would you define it? And what differences does a peer-to-peer community have from other community spaces? Stephanie, do you want to kick us off? What is a peer-to-peer community? This one always gets a different answer from me, depending on where I'm at. Um, I think that if I was still early in my career, um, I would definitely say it's a a gathering, um, a place of conversation, a place in where there's a uniform topic that Mm -hmm. is having multiple discussions. Um, And that is very explanatory of an external user or customer facing community um and fast forward to now um when i think about the differences of peer-to-peer communities and other forms of community support um i make a differentiation between um internal versus external communities and it doesn't have to be um, non-exclusive to being a peer-to-peer but it definitely is always a type of support community. So that's what I would allude to when it comes to these terms. Absolutely. And Chantel, anything you'd like to add to in your experience with building peer-to-peer communities? Yeah. Um, I mean, like definitely would echo Stephanie, um, but I think I focus it's more on external so you know love to go back and learn more about more about the internal part of it but i think for us it, well for me it's always been just in a way like hyping people because i've worked with a lot of founders or being kind of like community peers and the whole thing is all often like advocating for each other supporting each other so it's been kind of like okay how can you support the emotional side of things the lived experiences um, the shared interest and I also feel like when it comes to peer-to-peer communities they tend to navigate around it like a shared topic um, so that's kind of more external ones but I think internal would love to hear more about that and seeing like you know just probably experience definitely like just I guess how you um, differentiate them in that manner because obviously being in external ones it's not always me managing them and even and, and even when it was internal it was still external folks said like you know it was like a, a business community but we supported like founders externally so absolutely stephanie would you mind kind of giving us your if you were to break it down and i know it's a complex question that you've probably been developing over 15 years but 
Uh, when you break down kind of the difference between internal and external, what does that look like in your mind at a high level? That's a really good question. Um, at a high level, I would say that breaking down internal versus external um, really comes down to how extensive the support that is given. And when I say extensive, it's not saying that one group needs it more or the other. Um, talking about uh, the types of touch points that you have in your community. And what that means is that, um, example, and I love using examples here. Um, there are, and when you're talking about an external community, uh, there might be onboarding processes that are unique to an external facing community, such as welcoming a new customer, yeah. welcoming a new partner, um, showing a new user where to find everything in your community, how to get help, right? Whereas if you're talking about an internal community, uh, most times I like to use it as, um, if you're talking about like an employee community, right? And the employee community is maybe onboarding is offsetted to HR or onboarding groups, right? And same with uh, different areas of um, helping a new employee find their way around the company. There's processes that help them find their way around their community that are very like and similar. Um, so this is just, again, a very extremely broad example of what I would say kind of the small touch points that occur, but they're just applied in a different way, um, depending on the type of internal versus external community. Oh, perfect. And thank you so much for sharing that, Stephanie. I think that will be really helpful uh, for folks who are listening in. So with that in mind, both Chantel and Stephanie, um, that brings us to our next question, which is when you're thinking about peer-to-peer -peer community, what can a community manager do to align their community with the goals of their organization and how can they measure the impact? Um, Chantel, like you said, sometimes uh, with peer-to-peer -peer -peer communities that are more external, you might be navigating those relationships and boundaries and that might be the focus. But to your point, Stephanie, too, with those internal communities, there might be a lot of touch points that you're trying to orchestrate as a community manager. So I'd love to hear both your thoughts on how can a community manager navigate this space with aligning their goals and then measuring their impact. And I know that's kind of the always the big question with community management, but I'd love to hear both your thoughts. Do you want to uh, start first? Amazing. Yeah, I definitely feel um, the first starting point would definitely be defining and then what gap you're trying to fill. Um, I can kind of like boldly say that a lot of organizations, if they're going to give you a budget to even run a Facebook community, they want to make sure that, you know, they're getting money for, like, uh, for the buck. So I think it's understanding, okay, like from a, from a business perspective, what kind of goals are you trying to achieve? So often it's like the gap that they're trying to fill is that, for example, like if, if you have a, a community that's based on customers, um, you can still call it a community for, like, for peers, but I think it's more to do like, think about it, like a, a form, for example, um, often it's questions about how to use a tool to kind of think about tech, as an example. Um, how to use a tool and often in, in a forum format, um, the pairs will be helping each other out. So as a from business point of view, it'll be looking at like, hey, like, as we're going through, you know, managing, you know, the community on in these problems, are we looking out for like safeguarding? Um, are we going to make sure that, you know, you know, our names are tarnished? So I think, you know, it's for, for, I guess for a lot of companies will be like looking at like, how can we ensure that we create these platforms and these touch points for people to connect, but also ensure that, you know, the companies in, I guess, in a positive light. Um, and then from like another kind of, you know, like organization point of view, it could be looking at, you know, um, what kind of resources can you give? So I can give an example. So I've ma managed a community which was for uh, a VC firm, and the idea was that 
when it came to those that they were going to deploy money to, they had you know internal support. Um, but for those that did, as we you know, that they couldn't probably invest in, they wanted to support them in some capacity. So what I my job was way to facilitate that that you know like I guess resources. So whether it was from like you know using the community platform users like for example um, to start conversations and find other touch points to support them. From a business perspective, it looked great because it was improving their um, you know, the reputation. Um, it was show, you know, it was creating awareness for the VC firm, um, and it was also like just showing that I guess it was, it was building trust as well. Um, so I think after we think about measurements, we think about the you know the money. But sometimes if the community is free, like your impact won't be in, in revenue. It will be through you know the retention part of it, the engagement. So I think it's really homing in on what gap you want to fill and if it is foster connections how does that come up so it's a case of you know how many one-to-ones you had per month or how many people came to an in-person event how many people signed up to a newsletter so there's many touch points you can think about and many measurements but i think it comes back to what is the community for and if it's if it's pair-to-pair um you know like how do people kind of perceive that is it kind of more hands off is it very you know very non salesy where you didn't mention the company and it's more just a kind of avenue where people connect or is it more of like actually you know baseline is that it's focused on their product for example and everyone knows they're there for that reason so i hope that helps but yeah it's not a straightforward answer unfortunately but impact can be different to many people absolutely thank you so much for sharing all of that Chantal. And Stephanie, anything you would like to add when when it comes to um, measuring goals and impact with peer to peer communities? Um, you know, I want to just amplify what Chantal already said when it comes to um, measuring peer to peer communities, um, and I would only add that. Um, for my particular um, roles that I've, I've been in more recently, uh, we've accounted uh, employee sentiment as part mm-hmm. of um, how we measure impact, right? Um, with the rise of hybrid and more on site working, um, we look at the collective sentiment of employees as a way of measuring impact. Uh, because while we do work and collaborate in person, um, we're not fully back to yeah. in person, right? And so when we think about our internal and even just our peer-to-peer community um, engagement, we consider that as part of how we are productive. And so if sentiment is low, meaning that people are dissatisfied or for whatever reason unhappy um you know that's impact that's impact not just on the community itself but it is an impact on the company's culture um the morale yeah and most of all just how we feel about each other right um and i'm not saying that as to be cagey or vague, but it's just how we feel about each other can vary, but the collective feeling when being around one another is impactful on your day to day. So an example here, Uh, for me, I've been working remote since 2017. So I've not really been as impacted when the pandemic had many, many people start working remotely. And I want to caveat this in saying that not everybody is happy with being remote, right? Like there are just different needs for different people. And I just want to acknowledge that going remote for others might be, you know, not difficult, but challenging as that's not something that fulfills their needs, right? Mine aside. That being said, coming to work with a diverse and mixed group of people, if there are some who aren't having their needs met and fulfilled, that's going to impact the way that our team collaborates and works with one another, and thus impacting the value of actually getting together within our peer-to-peer community and how we support our community, how we 
present and show ourselves every day. So again, it is, again, I, I feel like there's like kind of a generic explanation for it, but I do acknowledge that there's more nuances that come into play when it really comes down to it. Absolutely. And that kind of tees us off perfectly, Stephanie, for our next question, which is how can peer-to-peer communities cultivate trust and openness? So I think you're already starting to scratch the tip of the iceberg with what you just shared. And I'd love for you to kick us off on uh, our next question with that in mind. (laughs) Absolutely. And I'm just tailing off of what I just mentioned, um, different challenges, different needs for others. And I think that when we speak about empathy and active listening, um, this is how we create and maintain bridges within peer-to-peer support networks, um, especially in times of uncertainty or challenge. Um, And when I say that, I'm not talking about, you know, an event that happens and impacts everybody. I'm talking about just overcoming team or even interpersonal challenges, right? It could be communication, it could be, you name it. But I would say that communication overall is the crux of what would be the biggest yeah goal why empathy and active listening play such a pivotal part in not only building strong connection but maintaining them so yeah communication that's what it would come into Communication is key, as they say. And Chantel, anything you'd like to add to what Stephanie shared when it comes to building a culture of trust and openness um, in a peer-to-peer network? Yeah, so I think I definitely want to echo what Stephanie said. Um, But I think the bit I want to add to kind of add a bit more to is is, is kind of the the world affairs and the personal, uh, I guess, worries. So I think one thing I've often found is we can't be afraid to speak about the elephant in the room. Um, so, for example, like you know, in in the past, I've you know, there's been a lot of things going on, you know, in politics um, that impact people's daily lives. And I, I know, like many people, kind of say to stay out of politics, but it's like, like if it's something that will impact the majority of your group, you don't have to take a a kind of political stance but you can you know speak about what's going to impact them um so without giving an example too much because i'm mindful of just you know everyone's different beliefs and stuff but um you know if there's a, a law that came in place that impacts the majority of your group if they are women for example you can't ignore it so for me one thing i found in terms of that is sharing, sharing resources um and also sharing kind of mental health resources as well because many people kind of suffer in silence um, and I think when it comes to empathy and active listening, you have to be aware that, you know, your, your community is not the only community that exists for them. Um, and I think in, like in, a, in, in, in a kind of trust building element, it's like when they realize that you've shut up for them in a hard time, that's like, wow, I can really trust them to actually like, you know, well, one, for me to actually want to be here. And then to, um, what was my video say, but I saw it. Um, and then also like, you know, you feel they feel safeguarded um, and they feel protected. So I think that is another element of the, uh, trust building because yeah if, if they feel seen they feel heard um, and they tend to come back so I think we can't miss out on the kind of vulnerability element of building trust absolutely and I love um, what you said at the end there too Chantal is if they feel seen they feel, they feel heard as well and especially in such vulnerable communities when we're sharing um whether it's the work environment or it is more um, external when you bring yourself to a community and you're not just going maybe uh, as an example to like go and find an exact solution to a problem you might be having um, and instead you're sharing it's really nice to be able to see others are sharing too so I think that's a beautiful way of sharing that Chantel. Um, So I guess that brings us to our next question which is uh, how do peer support networks and communities contribute to the overall well-being and resilience of community members? And um, I would love to hear from your personal uh, your personal work that you've done in communities or just, you know, those high level examples where you've seen that transformation uh, for folks who haven't yet um, been in 
a peer to peer community? What does it look like when, you know, the community is actually taking hold and you see that it's influencing that overall well being and resilience of the members? And Stephanie, would you mind kicking us off? Absolutely. And um, just want to say that Chantal already alluded to just the overall well-being and resilience. Um, I think to just, again, add to that is just maintaining familiarity. And I think that that is something that is very difficult to do. I, I understand that it's just very easy to say. Um, for community builders, familiarity could just read as if it's the branding, mm -hmm. where to find the site, right? Very simple things. But overall well-being and resilience can also manifest as um, how we moderate, right, in times of crisis. I think that um, when not in times of crisis, we tend to think, oh, this is like exactly how things are. But yeah. the point of moderation is to ensure that things stay safe for everybody. And so I would say that that could definitely contribute to the overall well-being is just to carefully and methodically and thoughtfully moderate um, especially when there are concerns or times of challenge uh, within the community. And I would say that the other um, effort is to really recognize uh, those who are doing more than um, their part of just being in the community itself. And what I mean by that is um, within a community, there are people who lurk or who are just watching, they don't seldom um, participate or engage with others. And then there's a core group of those who are active and of that active group, um, there are your extremely active members. And then uh, within the extremely active members, there are just your staff, right? Whether it's um, your moderators, your administrative team, um, the business partners, whomever, would be at the very most active um, of that group. And when I say that, um, you know, playing a part into this, it's usually the group that doesn't come out and say or do as much, right? And acknowledging those who do step forward, who do have just effort or exercise a little bit more than they normally would um, because not everybody can be 100% all the time, right? Um, a community can possibly be online or even organic, meaning alive at 24 seven, but that doesn't mean that the humans in the community are also 24 seven. So um, I would definitely say that acknowledging those who continue to support the well-being and resilience of a community um, without being prompted is, is very important. Absolutely. And it sort of sounds like to me, um, you're kind of like watering the community garden that you're building um, and actually like giving back and cultivating to the members who are helping others bloom, right? If you're having other folks pull others in, that would be a really great way to kind of anticipate uh, their needs as well. And Chantel, I would love to hear your thoughts as well um, when it comes to uh, this topic. Yeah, so firstly, that was very beautiful, Stephanie. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I guess I, I can't add too much because it was, it was just really beautiful that you like, even said it. But um, I can actually give an example. So um, I never forget, like, I was supporting a founder-led community and one of the members hadn't been in the community, like, active because they were very active. And they weren't active for a long time. And, you know, like, not everyone had each other's numbers. And I remember someone reached out to me being like, you know, do you have so-and-so's number or do you know, you know, like, do you have the email? Um, because, you know, they're usually very active and it was okay for everyone else. I would love to check in on them. And I just thought it was so beautiful because I'm like, you know, like, you know, like Stephanie said, everyone's human, we, we're not 24 hours, but just that kind of, of kindness of like, 
when someone's so visible and they're always looking out for everyone else, just having intentionally looking out for them, which is just a really beautiful kind of full circle thing. So yeah, I think that's just more example than any than, than actually adding a point to it because I think what you exactly said was really beautiful. So I don't want to overshadow it too much. Absolutely. And that's also such a beautiful story too, Chantal. I think it really crystallizes what you shared too, Stephanie. So I'm really glad we have that example too. Um, so our next question is, what are some common challenges that you face when it comes to uh, nurturing a peer-to-peer -peer community and how have you overcome them? So in your day-to-day -day work or in your consulting, how are you typically, what are the challenges you're facing and how are you overcoming them? I, not to jump in too much here, but when we talk about um, challenges, uh, I make two types of distinguish, distinguishing parts of common challenges. Um, but for the sake of this conversation, common challenges, um, especially when it comes to nurturing, for me, I think that the ones that I've encountered are definitely around membership right? Sustaining membership, growing membership, um, keeping membership. <laughs> uh, and when I say sustaining membership, it just means that, you know, not more people are, the equal amount of people are leaving and being inactive versus those who are joining, right? But when it comes down to challenges, that I think um, at least the biggest ones that I've overcome is, um, when we're dealing with internal communities and especially like employer ran internal communities um i can't ban employees mm -hmm. from internal communities they don't have the same tool sets that maybe some external communities leverage as a way of enforcement of either policy or behavior or um you know moderation uh, that's something that, you know, I, I, I've had to kind of live without, which is I cannot ban an employee, right? There's, a, I, I, and I'm not like, again, trying to be cagey or anything, but for the sake of our audience here, I just want to be clear. Um, the only time an employee is banned is when you don't work there anymore. <laughs> so there's a very, very clear divide, divider between certain tool or actions that might be very powerful to leverage in an external facing community. Now to overcome particularly my challenge is, is that we look at employees as sentiment. We monitor those for um, maybe behavioral concerns, um, maybe even violations. And we report those not just to our leaders, but to make sure that we have a close partnership with HR, right? Because there might be other areas that I'm not particularly attuned to that maybe our resources within the company can assist them with rather than saying, okay, this is a community problem to address. And so my point in all of this is that when overcoming these challenges, don't try to face them alone, mm -hmm. right? There's always something about your challenge that it, about your peer-to-peer -peer community challenge that can be looked at upon as a different lens and maybe you could better solve it by addressing the actual cause instead of the symptoms mm -hmm. that was beautifully put stephanie it's so thank you so much for sharing that i love how you highlighted and kind of brought to light how often it's a symptom, it can be a symptom when you're facing a challenge. And it's also multidimensional and kind of honoring what that individual might be going through, especially in an internal community context. Um, because it, I hadn't thought of it in that way that you really don't have the same moderation toolbox. Um, so do you find that those relationships in HR that you've developed have been um, helpful in kind of counteracting that the most? 
I don't, I don't want to just say that it's a helpful relationship, but I think that it's a critical relationship, right? Like, I don't think that I could actually do, do, do service and do what's right for those in my community without having this multifaceted approach to moving towards employee success. Okay, that's not like a community specific thing. And as I'd mentioned, this is possibly outside of my wheelhouse. And I don't want to go and address things without, you know, just careful consideration when it comes to each and every person's needs, right? Or even just group needs. Um, maybe I don't culturally have a firm understanding on what a specific group might need versus, you know, me, myself, right? And again, this is, when looking at this, even though we're dealing with an internal facing community, I always want to look for a very full and well-rounded solution that encompasses all external possibilities that could be of help, right? And it's not just about myself. And I think that that is one of the, maybe even a big challenge of what community builders like myself, you and Chantal face. And I, again, don't want to speak for you, but, um, you know, the challenge that we face is just <laughs> balancing and doing what's right, meaning what we know is right as a community builder versus what is right for our community itself. Yeah. Chantel, do you want to jump in here with uh, sort of the external perspective and just any thoughts on what Stephanie just shared? Yes, I think like, you know, Stephanie really touched upon the HR side, but I think it'd be, if it's really important to kind of think about what my experience has been working with clients and I haven't got a team. So I'm like, in a way I was kind of jealous, I was like, oh my gosh, Stephanie had a team, oh my gosh. Um, so yes, yeah, so like with me being kind of client facing and being the whole team, <laughs> you know, in the community side, I was like, how can I tap into my DEI experience? Because a lot of times there's a complex that you have to, I guess, Put out so I'm always big on pull out the fire before it starts um because we want to get to the stage of you know you have to mitigate risk um or like actually really kind of like maybe ban someone you've gone kind of a bit too far so I try my best to kind of put that fire out before it even starts and it's really just about like looking out being being kind of active to know like who's who um what some of the kind of general kind of concerns because also again I was working with founders um, and this was online during kind of a pandemic. Um, so to be mindful that, you know, everyone has a different kind of financial backgrounds or different stages in their kind of career. Um, and so what I found it was the challenge I had was not getting burnout. Um, because when you're, you know, client facing, you have set hours, um, especially being a freelancer, and also people are on different time zones because they're, you know, they're global. So I think, how do you ensure that you don't get burnout? And so for me, it was about how can I set boundaries where when I'm online, I'm online, but when I'm offline, creating the touch points where they can still get the support. So that comes back into the kind of peer-to-peer -peer element of it was allowing them to realize that actually, even though we are a global community, you, you know, there's a lot of people that might be in the same kind of state or same country or might have, you know, similar backgrounds that they can kind of support each other or even being like kind of similar kind of founders in the same industry. So kind of, I guess my kind of point is, if you are maybe a solo team, as in of one, um, how can you show that because you're supporting a pair to pair community that you give them back the power to to empower each other because you can't do everything. Um, and I think kind of another challenge I had as well was you know more from the kind of consultant element because I've done you know I've done management side but I've also consulted other other community um, community like pair to pair communities. And often what I found is. Um, Often when someone wants to create a community that's paired led, it becomes a bit homogenous and so it's not diverse. Um, it can be inclusive about being diverse because, you know, different kind of backgrounds, you know, but we are pretty diverse people. But often they find it's like, you know, because they created a community and pretty much people in that in the network has cut like so you have come um to join. Um, they find that oh my gosh, like I'm missing a lot of voices from this community. So often what I find in my consult my kind of like my one to ones is finding out like what type of what touch points they've created initially to engage people to, to join and then maybe what groups they're missing out on. So I'm also saying to people, you know, like if you're landing on your LinkedIn network, 
you might need to expand that. And also I think we miss, I mean, no, it's not a challenge, but I think to kind of help with that. Chantal, thank you so much for sharing that. And honestly, I think that both of your perspectives of um, overcoming challenges are so important in these peer-to-peer contexts because I think oftentimes as community builders, um, and I think Stephanie, you touched on this, we can feel um, like maybe the problem sits within the community. And from both of from bo- what both of you shared, I think it's really like the biggest lesson I'm taking from this at least. Um, so listeners is kind of taking that step back to assess what is the root cause or what is this a symptom? I think Stephanie shared that. And to, Chantal, to Chantel's point, um, you know, who are the stakeholders you can interview to get a better like kind of topographical understanding of that community space? You know, who can you start to pull in to like start to mitigate? Um, Chantel said it best with like, you kind of want to put out these fires um, before they even happen. So how are you preparing your community to have um, flexibility, resiliency, flexibility, and to evolve over time? Um, Because to Stephanie's point, it's not always going to be the same. Um, So sadly, we are at our last question, um, and I feel like we could talk about peer communities all day, but our last question is, what can community managers do to step back and view community from a more strategic perspective? So what are your tips for being more strategic versus being on the more operational side of things? I know we had nuggets all throughout the conversation, but if you were to go back and to tell yourself Um, even a few years ago, something that you know now uh, when it comes to community strategy, what would that be? And Chantel, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. I I don't know if this, okay, it's not a big bit controversial, but I actually think one thing I would tell myself beginning was actually sit in other communities. Um, You can learn a lot by, I guess, being a lurker in external communities, um, because I think me being in in a client-facing role often um it's kind of me doing my bad habits and yeah so I think like when you are in other communities seeing how other community professionals work um because there's so many community professional communities out there you can really kind of pick up really good habits and strategies so I think actually sit up communities see how they operate you know, what tools are they using? How frequently do they engage with the community? Um, one thing I found, found very useful is like, you know, for example, if I'm very busy in the community and they reach out to me, I'm like, okay, like, it's kind of looking and taking notes of how they reached out and was it kind of overwhelming? Just, you know, because I think you can learn a lot from your peers, but if it actually being a part of their communities. Um, and then I guess the last bit um, I'll definitely say is, Look after yourself, um, because I think, you know, like as much as, you know, we're looking at like the strategies and stuff, actually, you have to look after yourself and also even have that creative mindset and thinking capability, because if you're burnt out, you don't need, it becomes like more of a task and not a love and a passion. So I think it is important to even like look at yourself and sort of be like, OK, like, how am I feeling today? Because I think as a community leader or moderator, you, in a way, project your emotions onto the, the community. So kind of being like, okay, like, do, do I want to automate some things just to ensure that I'm not going to cost a certain way? Um, can I, you know, lean, lean on my team if there's a possibility? Um, because, you know, t- sometimes we we have things going on personally and we just don't want to shop in the community in that way. So I think, yeah, those will probably might be my two things. Yeah. Two brilliant tips, and thank you so much, Chantel. Stephanie, over to you to co- close us out. What would your tip uh, be? I heard tip meaning singular, and I'm here for singular or plural. Yeah, either you know, way. I, I, <laughs> I'm only saying that because I feel like this is, this is so hard, right, to actually pick out what a tip could be when it comes to taking a different perspective. And when I say different, it could be strategic, operationally, anything, right? And um, when we say, well, when I hear taking a step back, I always think of like, do you know like where you're going if you don't 
take a full step back and see maybe like a map or an outline of a path that you're going. Um, same with it being if your cup is full or not, right? Like, are you ready? Are you supplied up in order to take this this journey? So I think there's this um, importance of saying, take a step back, you know, take a look at not just the progress that you've made, but where do you want to go? And I think that this is very difficult for a lot of community builders because we're always like, wanting to move forward and you know a lot of times as Chantal mentioned we're like the only ones who are building so it's it's very difficult to feel as if you're like losing ground or losing progress by by doing these pauses but you know just like an athlete right are you training all the time and when are you resting so it's the same philosophy of practice when we talk about this in a community building lens we want to take survey of all that we've done and how far we've gone but to not lose faith in the idea that we're always progressing even when we are taking a pause yeah or coasting and i always say that because i think there's a lot of people out there that they hear community building and it's like an action yeah. and i'm here to tell you that after a decade and a half of doing this, there's only so much action you can do. There's only there's only so much progress you can do before it's it's no longer feasible to measure what you've done because you lose track of what you've done or you no longer can sustain what you've done. Um, and so just putting it out there and if you need any words of affirmation from anybody who's been doing this for a while it's okay to slow down it's totally fine to pause it's totally fine to reevaluate it's fine to change your mind it's also fine to stop to do something that has either exhausted or run its course and it's also fine to just simply stop because it's the best thing for the community at that point and such good words of wisdom stephanie Thank you for the many tips. <laughs> Those are fantastic. Chantal, Stephanie, this was a incredible conversation. I wish we could talk for hours on end about peer-to-peer -peer communities. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Uh, in the show notes below, you'll be able to find uh, any resources that we mentioned and then also links for uh, contacting Chantal and Stephanie and to learn more about them. Thank you so much, everyone.